We've got to be more concerned about the country, the Senate, the state of Nevada, than us. And as a result of that, I'm not going to run for re-election. My friend Senator McConnell, don't be too elated. I am going to be here for 22 months, and you know what I'm going to be doing? The same thing I've done since I first came to the Senate. All right, let's get to work. Welcome in our victims. First up, an award-winning journalist, the Take No Prisoners kind, which makes her a favorite on this show, the founder of JaneUnchained.com and host at ConnectPal.com. Always a pleasure to welcome Jane Velez Mitchell. She joins us from our New York studios. And here in our studios now, one knows, uh, no one knows about image and branding more than president of the M Network Branding and Strategy. He is a shy and very quiet man. Tom Moslum joins us here in the studio. How'd I do? Did I get that right? Yeah, demure. That's yeah, that's demure. Demure. I like that. So between you and Jane, we're talking about, and myself, we're talking about three really demure people here. Jane, I'm going to throw this to you first. Here we go. Harry Reid says, I'm not going to run for re-election in 2016, but he's still going to be around in 22 months. Republicans are giddy. But should they really be giddy, and is it really going to make any difference? Well, first of all, I have to talk about the optics. What on earth was Senator Harry Reid thinking by going on camera with that black eye and that <laughs> fogged up lens? He looks like a villain in a James Bond movie. I'm sure Saturday Night Live is working on the skit already furiously. But his eye is I injured, mean, Jane. God. That's the eye that he hurt in the, in the accident, so though. So issue a press release. <laughs> I mean, that, that was comical. I literally fell over laughing. I do think we need new blood. We need new blood not just in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but we need new blood in new parties. This Democrat-Republican game in Washington is old. The millennials aren't buying it. We need new solutions, new parties, new blood. It's all good. It's got to change. All right. Well, here we go to new blood here. And Tom, I guess from an image standpoint, this fits to you perfectly because Jane is not too happy with it. And I, you know, of course, there's people out there going, Arg, Senator Reid. Good oh, to see, see you. Man. You, see, see. you knew I was going to go knew there. I you were going there. Come on. That's <laughs> but you, easy. But what about the, is it, first of all, the optics a big deal here in your mind? Well, the fact that he said, yeah, listen, it has nothing to do with, uh, with my health at all, and then shows up black and blue with the eye patch. It's like a Monty Python scene. It's just a flesh wound. Don't mind. It's just a flesh wound. But to Jane's point, this is really, it is good for the party. It's good for everybody. But I think the best thing that's going to be is good for Harry Reid. He's going to be far better on the campaign trail working for the Democrats than he is embroiled in his own nasty Nevada race. And he's going to be a far better tool in the Democrats' pocket there than the tool he is so, right so, now. <laughs> Never mind. Stop. <laughs> Very well put. D do you think then that, no, really, I mean, and I'll get to this point, Jane, I'll get to you in just a sec, but let me get to your point when, when you make this right now. Does this mean now that he is much more powerful, he is like, he is risen from the ashes now. The phoenix will be even more powerful now than ever before. I think he is going to step easily into the role of kingmaker. Yes, I think he will. I think he will sit there on the sidelines, raise a ton of money, have his voice heard by the people who want to hear it, and not bear any... You know, look, how many ads can you see with so-and-so candidate is just a puppet of Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, and Barack Obama? Well, let's speak about someone here who is not a puppet, because I have to move on here. And Jane, I'm going to throw this to you. Here come most Americans in a new poll, 65 percent say their opinion of Hillary Clinton has not changed in the wake of the email controversy. 65 percent, they say it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Didn't we really expect this? Yeah, because I think it feels like, in your gut, like a manufactured, ginned-up crisis uh, scandal. The fact is that, listen, if we started looking at the emails, for example, of uh, congressional Republicans, God only knows what we would find. She was in a no-win situation. If she revealed her emails, uh, you would have thousands of Republican operatives studying each and every word to try to come up with a scandal. So we don't see her emails, so that's another scandal. The truth is, this isn't a real scandal. You know what a real scandal scandal is invading the wrong country under false pretexts, uh, false pretenses, for example, saying that there's weapons of mass destruction when there isn't. That's what I call a real scandal. This is just a manufactured crisis, a manufactured scandal, and I think the American people saw right through it. Uh, indeed, uh, Tom. I, I, you know, Jane, well, Jane, once again, is also very calm and, and demure as well. Do you agree <laughs> or disagree? She has a point, but branding is branding. Branding is not a one-time deal. This is about Hillary's brand. It's not about this instance. It's the compilation of years and years. There's not going to be another Hillary scandal. Everybody who hates her hates her as Wait a minute, there's now. not going to be another Hillary scandal? There's not going to be one that there's really... There's already been a few. That comes to any consequence at all. If you like her, you like her, and she could nail puppies to the door if she wants to, and people oh, are going to still vote God for her. If 
you don't like her, you don't like her, and you're not going to like her if she, you know, raises St. Teresa from the dead. I think that's going to be fair to say, and I think that Jane, if we had a couple of seconds left, she'd be very unhappy with the thing the you just said about comment. the I know, puppy I knew comment. The puppy comment did not make it. Jane, I'm with you on that one because I'm taking in the task right here in the break, so hang on a sec. We're going to get you for that one. All right. When we come back, we have to get more serious here for a moment and look at the French Alp crash and now some news about a depressive pilot. That's next, right here on the arena. First half of the Friday Arena continues. Award-winning journalist, founder of JaneUnchained.com, host at ConnectPal.com, Jane Velez Mitchell's in New York. And here in our studios, president of the M Network Branding and Strategy, Tom Mosloom, joins us. He will not be singing Tom Lehrer's Poisoning Pigeons in the Park, just in case you're wondering. I thought we'd go ahead and get there, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, let's turn. Don't worry about it. We'll get more serious. Okay. Uh, or serious. You promise? Promise. Okay. Here we go. Let's talk about what's happening with the plane crash now. There is a word coming out that the German Wings co-pilot apparently kept his illness secret. They found a ripped up letter from his doctor in his apartment that indicated that he was suffering from a depressive case and he was apparently trying to keep this away from his employers. I don't know what else Lufthansa could have done if somebody, Tom, is out there and doesn't want you to know, first of all. Second of all, who's going to actually go up to their employer and say, hey, I'm suffering I'm from depression? Feeling a little crazy today, I think I might wreck the plane. I don't think anybody's going to do that, especially if you have depression. You're usually the last person to know you have depression. Or the last person to want to admit it in many cases. And it's all often seen as a sign of weakness. It causes paranoia. Nobody wants to talk to their employer about this stuff. By the same token, there are laws in place that prevent doctors from calling the employer and saying, hey, you know, Tom's on the set today. He might be a little wacky. You can't do that either. We There's made that privacy. call 20 minutes ago. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm here. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Jane, isn't it fair to say, though, that when you're dealing with somebody and a pilot who has hundreds of lives in his or her hand, you want to know this. This is something that needs to be known, and you've really got to dig deep to find this out, because if it happens once, my God, it could happen again. There is a solution here. In the 21st century, a pilot should not be able to rip up a doctor's note like a schoolboy and get away with it. We have the technology to create a database for all medical information for everyone. But many and we're times not you're not allowed it. to tell them, We're not doing it for though, you and me. But for him to sign up as a pilot, for every pilot, there should be a contract where they say, you have access to all my re medical records at all times. And that database should be available to the airlines at all times. That would certainly have caught something like this. The idea that wow, somebody Jane, that's a today can slope, rip though, up a note. I mean, how many other things are you going to, how many other professions do you want to make sign that type of a letter? I mean, that's a slippery slope when you start how getting about into privacy. the U.S. Army? How about um, the DEA? How about the Secret Service? But you're dealing I with government agencies fine. there. Those are government agencies now. Here we're dealing with a private business. Well, under your logic, Jane, you we should have, have every doctor, pilot. every lawyer, anybody who has anybody's life in their hand in any capacity sign away their privacy rights. I don't think we want to go there. Let me tell you this, every time I go to the hospital, the ER, because something's wrong, I've got to fill out something manually. When my life could be in danger, I'd like to have all access to all of my records from any hospital I visited at the ready immediately. There should be a database, and in certain circumstances, like if you're a pilot and you have the lives of 149 people in your hands, that should be accessed by the airline. I gotta give I Jane that I gotta give Jane that one because when you've got people's life in your hands, it is a different case. But there's another way, and I think the United States has pretty good laws in place making sure that pilots are never alone in the cabin. They're not in there by themselves. There's always somebody in there with them. We also have laws that say pilots can be armed. This case doesn't happen. If the guy loses it and tries to crash the plane, he's quickly overpowered by the other guy you in the hope. cabin. Or at least there's a shot of safety. I mean, some accidents right. are never going to be solved or prevented, oh. but at least there are measures. And in this case, those measures weren't taken. And I My think that's a better start. My understanding is that, that airports now privacy. are just starting. My understanding is that airports now, airlines now, are just starting to have two people mandated in the, in the cockpit. And as one expert pointed out, if it's a female flight attendant with a big burly co-pilot, that may not be the solution either. I also feel there should be cameras in the cockpit and indeed all across the plane, monitored by people on the ground That's at all what times. I think we're coming so to. That That's what I think we're coming yeah. to eventually. I, I think we're going to get That's there. That's a much better solution than having people sign away their rights to privacy. I'm all in on that, but I, I, I get a little nervous about the slippery slope when we're talking about 
every medical record should be open. I got a minute to go here before we take a break. I want to get one more thing in here. I was appalled and disgusted today when I went on various social medias and found a lot of these fourth and fifth rate hack job websites all reporting that he was a Muslim sympathizer, he had a Muslim girlfriend, he knew Muslims. They were immediately making this run. Jane, this was reprehensible. But then again, thank goodness none of the real agencies picked it up. There is no, zero, not a proof that there's any Muslim connection here. But people were jumping on that, Jane, just to try and get some news out there. Well, you, know, you expect that. You expect people to immediately try to make a connection to terrorism. We need to start thinking uh, more psychologically. We need to become more psychologically aware as a society. A lot of these problems that we're classifying as political are really basically about people who are mentally ill in positions where they can hurt other people. Well, that's another point. Tom, and this is just a quickie right shot. Right on this. I mean, listen, nobody's happier at these connections than the terrorists themselves. That's what terrorism is. They do an act and it grows well beyond that. Anytime somebody stubs their toe, they're going to blame it, blame it on ISIS. We can't be there. We have to be a little more intelligent as a society. And as I just kept telling people in some of the discourses I got involved in, stop believing these fourth, fifth, and sixth rated hack job websites who wouldn't know journalism if it spit in their face sometime. But that's the way people are. All right, still on the arena dance cart, he is without a doubt the most influential comedian in the history of the world. And it's not Mel Brooks, I'm shocked. The arena continues. Last roll out of the first half of the Friday Arena continues in New York. Award-winning journalist, founder of JaneUnchained.com, Jane Velez Mitchell, and here in studio, president of the M Network Branding and Strategy, Tom Mosloom. Jane, I'm going to go ahead and start with you on this one. They now have found two new National Guard individuals, men who were involved in the, in the American military. They found them basically deciding whether or not they were going to head overseas, become part of ISIS. It, it, it again comes down to, are we doing enough to find these guys, I think, is what a lot of people want to know. This was informants who were lucky enough to latch onto these two before they actually went overseas. But are we doing enough? Some people say you need to go back to profiling to find these criminals. Well, I want to make an observation first, and I think we created this monster by giving ISIS all this publicity. They are uh, another bad movie dressed up like villains in some kind of Batman or some kind of horror flick. And what did we do? The American media put them all over the world and made them famous. So every... Uh, person with uh, emotional disturbance, psychological disturbance, who's craving attention, negative or positive, who wants to feel powerful. But what are we supposed to do, Jane? What are we supposed to do? You and I are well, in the same business as a I, journalist here. We have to report the news, don't we? No, listen, there are plenty of things we don't show on this uh, on television because we deem it too offensive. We don't show factory farming. We don't show nine billion animals being slaughtered for food. God forbid. But yet these villains, these these horrible people, they dress up in these uh, black outfits and, and they look scary and they all sort of look glamorous at the same time. Let's plaster that all over the television because it results in ratings. It's ratings driven. So what we should do is if we want to prevent emotionally disturbed people from in our country from trying to join ISIS, we should stop glamorizing ISIS, and we should take them off the airways. Report okay. the news without showing their Okay, let me go there. I do want to just make a point here. I do want to make a correction. It was one man who was involved in part of the National Guard. The other was a cousin. I want to make a point to that so it's not two National Guards. So go. there's two points I'd like to make on this. One, the law of averages suggests that there's going to be some people out there who are attracted to crazy. So... I don't think that this is an epidemic and we're in danger of ISIS recruiting loads of our servicemen to come over to the other side. That's not an issue. However, I think Jane is 100% correct on this. These people are crazy people, and if we've learned something over the years of television that I've been in it, the way you deal with crazy people is not to glorify them, not to glamorize them. Uh, and if well, they're... Wait a minute, YouTube is glamorizing more than the national networks are, because even as Jane pointed out, we don't show beheadings, we don't show a lot of the blood and guts, we basically blot that out, so aren't we supposed to report the news? It's YouTube and the social media that glamorizes we're doing more than anything else. We're doing a three and a half minute segment on this. These guys are crazy people. But it's news. I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure that this is news. I'm not sure that a guy who's disturbed 
out in Indiana or Iowa or where he's from and his cousin want to go join the people who hate America because they hate America too. I don't know that that's news. I think there's plenty of people who hate America right here in, you know, 50 miles from the studio. That's not news either. This group is not as powerful as you want them to be, oh, as the news group okay. wants you, them to you, be. You, you have opened up a, a whole can of worms for another time here. Just real quick, Jane, I, when he said he's not as powerful, I got 30 seconds from you on that one. Then I got to move on. What do you think of that? I agree. I think we've created uh, an institution, ISIS, that seems so scary. And if we just deglamorize them a little bit, we realize they're just... Uh, average people wearing black outfits and who are very vicious and uh, who are killers and who are willing to do the unthinkable by beheading people, but we shouldn't give them a platform. All These right. I, I, I'm not Why too sure if you can call them, them average people, though, Jane. Can you That's just call right, them Jane. regular well, people? Saying, they cut what people's I'm saying heads is off. Average well, no, what I'm saying is that they're not specially powerful. They're not, uh, they don't have superpowers. We've turned them into these negative superpowers, and that's what they're not. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we're there because last no, time I checked, none yeah, of us have superpowers, right. but that's all right. I've only got a couple of minutes, and let's rip through a couple, two things real quick. I want to make sure we get to. Uh, Jane, the DEA agents who had sex parties with prostitutes, boy, it's good to see our tax dollars are being used very well by the Drug Enforcement Administration, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know, we had the same scandal with the Secret Service. This is part of the moral corruption of our government agencies, and it's across the board. Uh, essentially, all these agencies have been infiltrated by the people they're supposed to monitor, and uh, the fact is that more people are ODing in this country from legal prescription drugs than they are from illegal drugs. The war on drugs, which is sending all these uh, DEA agents down to uh, South America, is a joke to begin with, and now it's been exposed for the real joke that it that is. That it really has. Okay, 30 it's seconds of you on this. It's the hypocrisy that violates the brand. If you're hired to get rid of the drugs and catch the bad guys, you can't be partying with them and having prostitute parties with them. I mean, it's just, it's a bad black guy. It looks terrible. It's everything that's wrong with this type of marketing. And that's what it is. It's marketing. All right, couple of minutes that we got left here. Last <laughs> shot. Today, they are hanging a portrait of George Carlin in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, basically calling George Carlin the most influential comic in American history. Mr. Moslem, I leave it to you first of all on this because I got to step out of this one. I agree. I don't know if he's the most influential in history, uh, but certainly one of the best in my lifetime. But influential question. is the word. That oh you're yeah, no. Out. I mean, influencing a culture. In influencing and just poking fun at all of the idiosyncrasies of how we do business about our government, about our policies. Then who else is it? If it's not Carlin, then who do you go for? Well, I mean, he beat out Groucho Marx, and to say that Carlin was more influential than Groucho just seems to me to dictate how distant we are from the humor of Groucho Marx. Well, but it's been a long time, too, and Carlin, of course, was in the mass media era. All right, Jane, I throw this to you. As I said, Carlin gets my vote hands down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, remember his infamous seven dirty words and his message was that humor can be used to tell the truth and that obscenity isn't dirty words. Obscenity is war and violence. And so he used humor to make social commentary and say things that nobody else could say because he had the you know what to say them. Well, Carlin also said, and again, you hit it right there. It's all words. He would say words out loud and say, put them out there, get them out, get them out of your system and they get less power when you get the words out and the seven words you can't say on television. By the way, Jane, I think there's one of them you can say now, but we're not going there. Just, I'll, I'll do it off air. I think mm -hmm. yeah, you can do it oh, off no. air. Jane Velez Mitchell, <laughs> always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, have a Jane. wonderful day. We'll see you again Thank soon. You. Tom Moslem, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. We did make that crazy call, by the way, and we're still awaiting an answer. You can come by anytime and bring your Carlin tapes. I didn't rip up the note. That a boy. There you, go. there you go. Here it is, not even April. We've already recorded the first 100 degree temperature of the year in America, 101 in Death Valley. There's more heat to come. Jessica Reyes holds comments on the Newsmax weather map. Hello, I'm Jessica Reyes, and here's your weather for your Friday. We start off with some good news, fairly warm conditions for our friends by the Pacific coastline with daytime highs reaching between the 70s and 80s. Record challenging conditions for the southwest. Daytime high of 91 for Fresno. Feeling summer-like in Los Angeles with a daytime high reaching the mid-90s at 94 degrees. Not so much for the Great Lakes area. High pressure pushing through, which means no rain for us, but daytime highs only reaching the lower 30s. So bundle up as you head out into parts of Houston for today. A lot 
warmer with uh, mainly sunny skies into Houston and Dallas as well. And then across the southeast, unfortunately, we're dealing with showers and thunderstorms, a threat of severe weather. So keeping a close eye on all of that. Across the northeast, a lot of that rain is going to push through. And here are some of your daytime highs for your Friday. Have a good weekend. You wanted summer? Guess what? You got it. At least in some parts of the country, it is warm. A special edition of the arena is next. The problem with citizens and cops when it comes to American law enforcement from two men who lost their sons in senseless shootings. That's coming up next when we continue on the arena on Midpoint.